Hi everybody, Mr. Gottlieb here with a cryptology video for you. Today I want to talk about the ADFGVX cipher. This was used during World War I, as you'll see in the reading, uh, and we'll talk about how to break this later, but right now I want to talk about, talk about how to encipher with it. Uh, and you may be wondering why did they use ADFG, V, and X? And you have to go to your Morse code, which is over on page 62. Uh, a is a dot and a dash. D is a dash and two dots. F is dot, dot, dash, dot. G is a dash, dash, and a dot. And the V is going to be dot, 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 and a dash. And your X is dash, dot, dot, dash. And the reason they use those is because they're all pretty dissimilar. You got a dot, dash here, and then there's only one other dot, dash here, and dot, dash here. I guess there's a dot, dash here, but these are different enough versus like just a dot or uh, two dots, etc. So they felt these letters were different enough that they made sense to use for Morse code. Maybe it doesn't look that way, but that's what they thought at the time. So of course, then they got, got broken too. So maybe it's not that great a thing. Anyway, uh, so what I'd like to talk to you about is how to decipher using the ADFGVX cipher. And what you're gonna wanna do, you're gonna wanna draw a grid. So I'm going to draw some columns here. And it's very important that you know your columns versus your rows. These are columns. And these are rows. So I'm going to do A, D, F, G, V, and X down the side. Okay. Now, you're going to fill in all 26 letters of the alphabet plus all the numbers. Okay, so this is kind of nice because it enciphers letters and numbers. So I'm just going to throw in 9, 7, B, R, Q. T, so you gotta keep track of what letters are. It might help to write all the letters and numbers off to the side and cross them out as you throw them in here. You don't want any duplicates. Uh, let's see, A, 6, C, 5, E, X, R. Nope, did R already. See, that's why you gotta keep track of this kind of stuff. P, M, O, we'll differentiate that with a zero. I'll throw a zero here. You know what I could have done is just gone through the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, throw them in random spots, and then all the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G, instead of just thinking of random letters. That might be a faster way to do it. So let's try it that way instead. Well, let's see. Okay, so I got zero. I'll throw one here. And you want to differentiate between one, L, and I, because obviously those can look very similar depending on how you write them. Uh, so zero, one, two, three, four. We did five already. We did six, seven. Uh, I'm going to make sure that this is an eight and not a B and then nine, so we're done with those. And now we've got A, we did B already, we did C, we need a D, we did E, we'll need an F, we have, we'll need a G, an H, I, J, K, L, and we already have, we need an N, we already have an O, we have a P, we have a Q, we did an R, so we did an S, again, that's gotta look different from your five, T, and then U, and V and W. And I think we did something. I oh, oh nope. W, X is there, Y, and Z. And I usually put a line on my Z's to keep them straight. Okay? So there we have all our letters. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna read these off by row and then column. So we need a plain text message. Let's do hello. Just a short one. So this is my plain text. Hello. H, I look for my H here, and H comes from V and V, so I replace H with VV. Next, I have an E. E comes from DV. L is going to come from GD, and another L would be another GD, and then O is going to be FF. Okay, now, this works better if I have a longer text, but I think we can still make this happen. Um, I'm gonna use a three letter word, okay, as my key. So the first thing is just enciphering it. And you would have to have this alphabet between the two people, the sender and the recipient. They would need to know what the alphabet encoding is gonna be. They have to know the key. So this can just be written on a, you know, a scrap piece of paper. It could be thrown in a book. Grab a, like a giant you know, thesaurus or something like that and just throw it on a random page as long as you know what page to look at. That would be a helpful way to keep the key hidden, but you do have to know that up front. Then what you have to have is a keyword. So we're gonna go with, um, for this one, I'll do, um, how about, um, 
rat. Do rat. So rat is going to be my key. So what I do then is I'm going to write the letters of this underneath of rat. So I have, again, columns, and I'm going to fill in the rows with these letters. So these are, this is the order right now. So V, V, D, V, and G, D. So G, D, G, D, and then F and F. Now, the reason I chose this one is so that you can see that if you run out of letters to fill in here, you throw in some gibberish, okay? Just throw in some nulls. So I'm gonna throw in um, another, uh, actually, you know what I'll do is I'll throw in an X and an F. Or, well, we used an F. Um, oh, I'll throw in an A. So I'm gonna throw an X and an A there. Why not? Just to confuse somebody, okay? The next thing that you're gonna do, this is the second part of the encryption. So we took our keyword, you know, this, we had our cipher here, and then we had a keyword. We wrote these letters underneath here, looping around, okay? So that's just running on to the next line. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna alphabetize your keyword. So this is A-R-T now. So what that does is that switches my V, or my A column goes here. So V, G, D, X. And then V, V, G, F. And then D, D, F, A stay in the same spot. And now my cipher becomes V, V, D, G, V, D. D, G, F, X, F, A. I just read this across. V, V, D, G, V, D, D, G, F, X, F, A. This is what I would send to somebody, okay? So we'll talk in the next video about how to decipher this. I'll walk you through the process, although you're just going backwards, basically. Uh, but that's the A, D, F, G, V, X cipher. That's how you encipher with that. I hope that helps. And uh, a comment was brought up that some people missed my rambling in class, and uh, I spent most of my time working on guitars. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to show you guys a guitar I was working on. This is a cool one. This is a uh, this is a '50s Gibson. I think it's just an uh, I think it's just an L O, maybe an L one. I don't know. So it's got different parts to it. This is these are the hips. These are the shoulders. It's got very very short shoulders. It's actually kind of a smaller body guitar. Um, but yeah, like I said, I believe it. Yeah, it doesn't have a. Uh, it doesn't have a serial number on it, and I don't think it has a marking inside either. Actually, I accidentally put something on the marking inside. Whoops. Anyway, yeah, it was an LGO, I think is what it was. But anyway, um, so what I had to do, I had to do a lot of stuff to this. It's kind of in the last phase of repair here. Uh, obviously, you can skip this part of the video if you're not interested in guitar repair. But I did a few things. When I got this guitar from, it, this is for uh, someone I know, um, the back, the, so you have the top and the bottom, or the back. And then the sides, and this was splitting apart. So I uh, I glued the back back on, clamped it together. That held nicely. Then the back, it's a two-piece uh, back, so it has a seam down the center. I had to glue that, but that's not going to hold. It's a very thin piece of wood. Uh, now it has braces inside. That is, I don't know if you can see this little bar going across the inside there. Uh, but there's these bars, there's four of them going across the back, and there's a couple on the top as well, but they go more in like an X pattern on the top. So on the back, those braces had all popped off because the back had popped off. This thing had been in a flood. So I glued the braces back in, and you'd think that would hold the back together nicely, but I added, if you can see, almost it looks like vertebrae in there, I added little cleats. So they're, it's actually two, uh, um, uh, popsicle sticks that I cut apart, uh, actually, I actually had to crimp them and, and snap them. They wouldn't just cut nicely. But anyway, um, I glued those. Those are going, their grain is going this way while the grain of the wood of the back is going this way. That'll keep, you know, if the back stretches apart, that grain is going to work. It's going to counteract that and keep it in place. So all those little pieces in there are going to help keep the back together and keep it from splitting. I put some cleats up here where this had split as well. I put the cleat, I don't know if you can kind of see it. There's one right under here. And then also, because this whole thing was pulling apart, the bridge, which is this part here where the strings uh, get pulled through uh, for the, for the, you know, so that you can play, that was pulling off. So I had to yank that off. I had to scrape the top down with a chisel and sand the bottom of this. And then I had to pop it back on. I glued it on with uh, what's called hide glue. And uh, right now, that's why it's all clamped up. I, I clamped it in place. And I actually had two screws holding it in place as well. If they hadn't been there, the whole thing would have ripped off already. And that just can happen over time or just because the you know, moisture, dryness, whatever. If you have big changes in your humidity, that'll cause issues. So I uh, clamped this together after gluing it. I've got the 
cleats gluing in place now. And uh, the only other thing I have to do is this sat in a case too long and there was foam like hardened attached to the back of this neck. So I tried scraping that off and it didn't come off nicely. I tried using some goo remover, that didn't work. So I ended up having to just sand it down to the bare wood and you can kind of see the difference in the color right now. Uh, that's where I had to sand it down to the bare wood. Uh, and it's just foam from just moisture and whatever, just from the case that it just latched onto the finish. This is a nitrocellulose finish. It's a very thin, thin finish. You can actually kind of scuff it up with your fingernail on like a polyester finish, which is much harder and uh, doesn't breathe as nicely. So there's, there's debate over which one's better for, depending on the person or depending on what kind of finish you want to have. But this nitrocellulose, it'll just bond with almost anything. Uh, even if you just sit there with your hand on it too long on a hot day, it'll start to move and melt. And it's just, it, it's funky, but I love it. I, I think it really allows the tone of the guitar to come out. So anyway, so the next thing I'm doing is waiting for a nice sunny day here so that I can uh, spray this down and glue it over. So that way, or not glue it over, um, lacquer it over. So that way I can get it back to like a nice clear coat kind of here. It's going to be discolored, but it's better than having a bunch of foam hard glued to the back of your neck. So uh, yeah, it's a neat guitar otherwise. Giving it back to the owner probably at the end of the week. Hopefully I'll have it finished by then. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that. I'll find something else to ramble about next time. Hope you guys have a nice day. Thanks.